Uh, well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for just making it to the talk just in time. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work, which I did with Jerome Dubai, who's uh, now with uh, CNRS in, in, at Not in Nancy in France. Um, okay, so, so I thought, uh, originally I thought I would start by defining the terms in my title, and then I've kind of revised my plan for this talk, so I'm not going to do that at the beginning, and I will define these as I go along. Um, um, well, let me define chiral anyway. So, uh, so by chiral, I mean something like, for example, in two dimensions in, in quantum hole systems. So systems where you, topological phases, where you have a gap in the bulk, and you have chiral edge modes, either integer quantum Hall effect or fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, now, in fact, in this talk, I'm going to uh, concentrate on free fermion systems. And, um, and in this case, we can actually broaden this. And basically, then we're talking about uh, topological insulators and topological superconductors. So they have topologically protected edge modes, which may not be chiral, in fact. And furthermore, they could involve dimensions bigger than two. Okay, and then the issue is, um, um, do there exist um, uh, tensor network states for such phases, chiral topological phases or whatever, in some suitably broad sense, um, um, with... Um, gapped, where the, for which the parent Hamiltonian is gapped. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm first I'm going to um, not even talk about tensor network states. I'm going to first just uh, talk about band theory. So it's like basic solid state physics, single particle stuff. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll go in, well, this will enable me to make definitions and uh, set up some notation, which we'll use. Then I will describe some tensor network states for, um, for free fermions. And, um, and then I will discuss the issues of uh, the gap and um, for the parent Hamiltonian. Okay, and feel free to interrupt with the questions. Okay, so we need to describe something about band structure. So first of all, I'm going to use um, d-dimensional space, and I'll assume a hypercubic lattice. I don't think I'm going to write everything on the board here. Um, so we'll have lattice sites, hopefully evenly spaced. And on each site we'll have, which, and this lattice, I really think of it as extending off to infinity, or we can use something with finite, uh, a cuboid-shaped box and periodic boundary conditions. Um, and each site is labeled by x, and there are um, n uh, states or orbitals, single particle states uh, per site. And these will be labeled by x and y and variables like that. Okay. So then we're going to have a general model. Um, and so if I use some um, uh, second quantization, so I'm going to use indices A running from 1 to n. And then I'll use uh, operators um, C, x, a, and the, and the adjoint and the anti-commutators of these Uh, will be the usual form, and the other anti-commutators vanish. And then a Hamiltonian, which is really a single particle Hamiltonian written in um, second uh, quantization here, um, will involve a sum over two positions x and y, and then a matrix and it depends only on the difference of x and y. So I'm going to do translation invariant systems only in this talk. Uh, C, Y, B, uh, something uh, like that, I think. 
And um, so this is the problem that you're given. Um, and so to diagonalize this, well, first of all, we can go use a Fourier transform. So we'll use Fourier transforms and we'll use things like CK uh, so that CX A is um, sum over K, CK A e to the i k dot x. So here we have c. What? No. Who said? Who mentioned the word Majorana? Oh. I have a dagger here too. Okay. Okay. And um, and then we get some um, c k a dagger c k b. Um, so now we've uh, reduced this just to a finite dimensional matrix problem for each K. Let me make another comment about that question actually. So, so what the case I'm going to focus on here throughout this talk, it seems pedagogically the right way to do it, is I'm going to take this simple case of, if you like, particles hopping. So I have a number conserving Hamiltonian and, um, and this will lead to the most, what you can view as the most basic class of uh, free fermion systems. But other, other cases of free fermion systems are basically this plus some additional uh, symmetry, symmetry or symmetry or symmetry-like operations on the Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is, doesn't look like the most general thing, but it's basically the starting point and you can do the other things. And also, if you're interested in superconducting systems or BCS paired states, um, that corresponds to certain additional particle hole-like symmetries in the Hamiltonian. You can do those as well. You can always map those onto these particle number conserving things by some, uh, by some, uh, by, by doubling the system. You can always obtain something of this form, except with some conditions on these matrices. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not, the simplest case is really this case and everything else is related to this. Okay, thanks for the question. Okay, um, all right. So once we have this, then our problem is basically to uh, diagonalize this matrix HAB with entries HAB for each K. And then we get some band structure. So K, of course, is living in the Brillouin zone, which is basically a torus. And for me, this is just K running from, uh, from uh, minus, uh, minus pi to pi. So I'm going to think of the lattice spacing of my lattice as just one and get rid of that. Um, Okay, so then if I find the eigenvalues, solve the eigenvalue problem, then I can plot these as a function of k, and that's when we get some curves here. So these are usually called epsilon k or something. And then we get these curves, which look maybe something like this, and this is why they're called bands. And, um, and there we are. Okay. Um, all right. So to diagonalize, um, we need uh, some uh, unitary matrix. So at each k, we have a unitary, uh, that's n by n, matrix, uh, which I'll call T hat. So this depends on k, and this um, is what diagonalizes this H matrix, so the single particle Hamiltonian. Okay. So... Um, all right, so the, uh, so the columns of T hat are the eigenvectors of uh, H at each K. Um, all right, and these eigenvectors, you know, each one is a vector in this uh, space of dimension N in C to the N. And as you move around in K, these vectors can move around and twist and possibly in complicated ways. And uh, so it's first realized, I guess, by Thaulus and, and co. in 1980 that you can obtain non-trivial, topologically non-trivial bands arise in, in, uh, in band structure, in old-fashioned band structure. As far as I know, that was the first time. Okay. Um, all right. So now what I want to consider is uh, I want to move on to the uh, many particle situation. So I want to uh, take something like this, and if I've drawn this correctly, I should be able to 
separate this band from this band. And I want to think of the, some of these lower bands as filled and the other ones as uh, empty. So then I have M filled and N minus M occupied. So I can do this using a reference state, which I'll write as something like this. And this is the state where we uh, just occupy um, for each k, we occupy the first uh, m orbitals, uh, not for k, for x, for each, for each x. Okay, so on each site, x, we simply fill up some of these orbitals. So we have a trivial state, if you like, kind of product state. So this is just a reference state. And with this reference state, then um, we can act with the many-body version of uh, T, a representation of this uh, unitary matrix for each K acting in this, in this uh, Fox space, and obtain the um, obtain the many-body uh, ground state. So we have a many-body version of T hat. We act with this on the ground state, um, and we get a state. And this is the state with which, uh, which I'm defining, if I've done it right, it's supposed to have the lowest uh, M bands filled. Um, so that's how it's supposed to be defined. Okay. And, um, and so this motivates us to look not so much in, at the individual eigenvectors as in the, the subspace of vectors spanned by the, by the uh, um, by the vectors at each k that are, that are filled and also the other subspace which are the vectors that are empty. So there's a filled, an empty uh, filled subspace, <coughs> filled subspace I'll call curly V. So this is a subspace of C to the N for each K. I often suppress the Ks when I'm doing this. And the complementary subspace V prime, which is also a subspace of CN, such that V plus V prime is Cn for all k, and uh, in fact this is orthogonal direct sum here. Okay, so we have the orthogonal complement. Okay, so for each k we have identified a subspace curly v, and also there's its orthogonal complement, and as we move around in k these subspaces can tilt around in a possibly non-trivial way. Okay. Um, all right, so let me define some things uh, in connection with that. So, so basically bands are connected with vector bundles. And the vector bundle, so basically V as a function of K um, is, a, is a vector bundle. It just means that, let's do it informally. So, vector bundle means that, so it's over the Boulouin zone, so, I, so each point in this, in the base space, this is the so-called base space, the Boulouin zone is the base space, but each point, I'll just call them points K, for K, K values in the Boulouin zone, and for each K, uh, we have, like over that, we have a vector space V, which is a subspace of C to the N. And we also have the complementary space V prime. Okay, and so this space V can change with position uh, in, or with K, um, but it's always embedded into the same space CN that we set up uh, uh, at the very beginning. So that's a vector bundle. And uh, a couple of properties uh, or terms are useful for, for vector bundles. So a trivial bundle, first of all, so we can talk about topology of vector bundles. Um, and, um, well, you might imagine that we have to do this using churn classes. 
um, although that doesn't fully characterize the topology of a bundle. Um, but although I may mention a churn number later, the only thing I need about um, the topology of vector bundles is the idea of a trivial bundle. So a trivial, a bundle is trivial, means that, um, and this is a basically just a topological definition, means that there exists a set of sections um, So again, the rank of the bundle. So here my bundle V has rank M. That's just the dimension of the, the fiber curly V at each point, always the same at all K. And there's a set of M sections um, uh, which are linearly independent at um, all K, at every K. So I realize I should have defined sections first. So a section of a bundle is basically a, a, a uh, function, a vector-valued function of k with, um, with a vector chosen from space curly v. So it always lies in the subspace okay? for, all, for each k. And this is um, a continuous function so it's defined for all k, and it's a continuous function of k. Okay. So sometimes I abuse this terminology a bit by talking about sections that aren't actually continuous everywhere, and I'll tell you when I do that. Um, so this is what we have. And um, in general, these sections, the section doesn't have to be non-vanishing everywhere. But uh, for when we talk about the definition of a trivial bundle, uh, the linear independence, if they're linearly in independent ev at every k, in particular, that means they, they must not vanish anywhere. Okay? So that's a trivial bundle, and that's just a topological definition working within the bundle. But there's also a term I want to mention at some point, if I don't run out of time, which is analytic. And this has to do with the fact that our bundle V is embedded into this space uh, uh, Vn at each k, and, um, and so this uh, statement is that there exists a neighborhood for any k, there exists a neighborhood of k, so for all k, there exists a neighborhood of k um, in which uh, there exists a set of m sections that are analytic, real analytic functions of uh, K. Okay, and you can just think of that in terms of the components of the vectors are analytic functions of K. Okay, so this means the bundle um, has uh, sections that vary smoothly, uh, at least in the neighborhood of some point. Take it small enough. Okay, so those are the bundles. Um, so now, uh, um, so now we can look at this uh, uh, ground state. And so first I'll make a claim here that the ground state, say psi, is proportional to something of the following form. Uh, so this is sum on k, gk alpha Alpha prime, now I really should look at my notes. Um, uh, so this is sum over k alpha alpha prime uh, or alpha bar um, ck alpha bar dagger ck alpha acting on this reference state that I had here. And first, uh, I have notation that alpha runs from 1 to m, and alpha bar runs from L m plus 1 up to n. And, um, and I should tell you what g is. So g is defined in the following way. So I can take my unitary matrix t hat, and I can divide it into blocks, u hat w dagger v dagger 
uh, v tilde hat and minus u tilde hat. And these blocks are of size m, n minus m, m, n minus m. And these are, everything here is a function of k. And gk alpha alpha bar is, uh, um, is um, u hat inverse v hat. And then we have to take the alpha alpha bar components. So this is an m by n minus m matrix. And I claim that this, in fact, is a description of the ground state. Now, this might surprise you. Why? How did I manage just to get this exponential of this thing here rather than uh, some, something that looks like a unitary matrix? This doesn't look unitary. It only involves some off-diagonal components in one block, basically, of uh, T. Um, so in fact, if you take T, which is unitary, you can write a representation of this acting in the many-body space for each K uh, as an exponential of something with T times some C dagger C kind of uh, operators. And uh, it's, it's explicitly unitary. But if you do some Lie algebra stuff to rearrange things and decompose the Lie algebra of it, you realize that some of those, you can uh, express it as a product of some different exponentials, some of which just map this state into itself. Um, or, the, or the terms just drop out, and the what's left is just this. Okay? Um, th if this is rather like a coherent state, so this is like writing for a general coherent state, um, some, uh, I don't know what notation to use for that, but if I write some S uh, minus with uh, some parameter alpha, and I have, a, for example, a spin a half, and I want to, S minus is the lowering operator for spin, then a coherent state can just be obtained using, using a lowering operator uh, up to a normalization factor. And that's the same kind of thing that I'm doing here, working in um, a space which is uh, UN. Um, the, the group of matrices is UN for each, uh, for each K. OK. Um, and so let me also point out that G, <coughs> then, dropping the indices and things, is really an element of a, of a Grassmannian manifold GMN, which you can define as UN mod UM times UN minus M. Um, and people who are familiar with quantum spins know this is exactly the sort of thing that you get for um, certain, certain rep with certain representations, totally anti-symmetric representations of UN. Um, um, then you get uh, something like this. In the special case where uh, M is 1, this becomes this becomes uh, um, Cp uh, n minus 1. And if also n is 2, this just becomes Cp1, which is also the same thing as the block sphere okay, that represents uh, states in Hilbert space up to no once you, if you don't care about normalization and uh, phase, as you don't for states. Um, OK, so this parameterizes this space. And uh, this is all the information you need. Um, so this basically is a one-to-one -one description of uh, something in this space that corresponds to a coherent state for each k. The only, the only trouble is um, that some of this space, some part of this space, requires g to go to infinity. And uh, then there's some little tricky business. And, but I'm not going to worry too much about that. OK. Um, all right, so this is sort of the geometry of this thing. And I can also show a, a separate way to convince you that uh, this is actually the correct expression, or a correct expression for the ground state. Um, which I can do by, actually I can do a couple of things. So one thing I can do is I can do particle hole transformation on the um, uh, on the uh, empty part, so that the C k alpha bar becomes C minus k uh, alpha bar dagger, and then I have something that looks like a BCS state. And furthermore, I can expand the exponential because these things all square to one, and so that the exponential is actually something like one minus g c dagger c dagger on the vacuum, 
for these operators, and this is just a BCS, kind of a BCS state. This is one of the reasons why this also includes superconductors. So normally you don't see band structure stuff written this way, but um, uh, this is useful here. And the other way to convince you about this is, um, so since uh, I'm going to think of this as describing a set of filled bands, then um, there are going to be some operators that annihilate this ground state. And the operators that annihilate the ground state, so some of them, well, they're just uh, single particle states, so um, single particle operators. So, uh, so my, so one of these is these are supposed to have hats on. These are elements of the corresponding matrices U and V. Um, and um, so these actually correspond to the filled bands. So this is an operator that tries to create particles in, these, uh, in the single particle states in the filled band. Since it's filled, this must annihilate the ground state. So this annihilates psi. And, and another set of these, the further ones for the empty bands, which are just destruction operators, and these have some form like V tilde hat K alpha alpha bar C K alpha minus someone alpha bar prime uh, U tilde hat K alpha bar prime alpha bar C K alpha bar prime. Okay, and um, and so these just annihilate states in the particles in states in the empty bands and therefore annihilate the ground state. Now, but can, you can also, so if you compare these with this uh, Gaussian looking wave function, because of this splitting into two parts, um, the, um, what happens is that the, uh, let's, use, um, let's use the one for the empty bands. So the creation part for the empty bands, for the, uh, for the empty, for the filled bands, um, it does not commute with this C here, so it pulls down the G C dagger for, for in this term, while the other one commutes right through this. Um, and if you look at this, then because uh, G is related to this um, uh, U inverse V, then uh, in, and, the, and I'm using the same coefficients there, which are taken from um, rows of U and V, then uh, in fact it, it completely cancels. I realize with all the indices and stuff, it may not be all that obvious. And a, a, a simple one-dimensional example, in fact, if you want to do the, the simple case, you can just drop all the indices. And, uh, and this GK is just V over U. And there I've got U and I've got V. And you should be able to see that it cancels. There's a Fermi minus sign that makes it work. OK. Um, and so that's it. And so this is why this is the correct state. OK. Um, so you can always do this. This is completely general. There's nothing, nothing special about this. It's just band structure. And I really ought to be getting onto tensor networks um, about now. OK. Um, all right, so now let's uh, talk about tensor networks. So the idea of a tensor network state is, um, well, how can we write down a trial state in a simple way? Well, one of the simplest ways would just be that we write down a product. And for each uh, lattice point, we just stick down a, some function, and, um, and uh, the product of all of these over lattice sites describes our many particle state. But that would just be a product state. So the next simplest thing you could do would be, uh, at least in one direction, would be to say that, um, say that I write down some amplitudes, and I let them depend on auxiliary degrees of freedom, maybe on the edges, and I take a product over all sites, and then I sum over all of these uh, auxiliary degrees of freedom that I've, that I've introduced. Okay. And, um, so, and so the point here is that this, these are just associated, they're shared between more than one site, so it's non-trivial, 
um, perhaps they're on edges, but anyway, they're certainly uh, only coupled locally near to nearby vertices. Now, in particular, you could just put all these on the edges, and that's called uh, PEPs. Um, I'm being a little bit more general here, um, although the things I write can be mapped into, um, honest to goodness, PEP states as well. Okay. So, um, so that's the general case. Now, what about for my free fermion systems? So for free fermion systems, I'm going to make a state where I'm going to use Grassmann integrals. And, um, and I'm not going to be very definite here about these things. Since it's number conserving, there'll be complex Grassmann fields. And I will basically have a Gaussian integral. And I will have uh, some kind of CK alpha <coughs> maybe just psi uh, or x, really, x alpha. And here I have a dagger. And then I may have something like uh, c x alpha bar psi x alpha bar uh, dagger. And then I have some quadratic form involving these things. And I have some matrix that depends on x and x prime and alpha and alpha bar and whatever. Psi, another dagger here. So it's a quadratic form, basically. And you can do this Gaussian integral. And the idea is that you cook it up. Well, you can, you can in any case, um, integrate this out. And you get something which is, again, of this form, g c dagger c, if I do it correctly. And uh, this, uh, this form, incidentally, was I'm supposed to have, again, my reference state on the right here. And again here. And so by integrating out these things, I can recover this uh, Gaussian thing that I had. And, and now the key thing here in, uh, in this um, tensor network form with these auxiliary variables psi is that simply that these matrices are strictly short range. So sometimes I call these strictly short range, meaning they're all finite range. Bruno called it this morning. So they're zero outside of some, outside of some distance. Okay. So that's what I need to really make it a tensor network state in the sense I've described. OK. And so now the consequence of that is that for the tensor network state, G is a ratio of, in K space, or the elements of G, since it's a matrix, are ratios of trigonometric polynomials. Okay, so trigonometric polynomials uh, means that they're polynomials in uh, sine kx, cosine kx, sine ky, cosine ky, and so on up to up to uh, up to d. Okay, and so this follows from ordinary Fourier transform stuff. If this thing just involves displacement by some finite number of lattice sites then I just get some e to the i kx's and what have you. And, um, and, uh, and there's a maximum degree that occurs so that I actually get a polynomial, which can be expressed in terms of sines and cosines. And these can be complex in general. All right. So this is the key statement. So now we have, as opposed to everything I said before, which was completely general for band structure, now I have what's special about tensor network states is that these guys are ratios of trigonometric polynomials. OK. And at this point, I don't really need to think about the tensor network nature of the state again. In fact, at least that's not the way I'm going to do it. Do it. So the point now is to analyze things with, with this condition. Excuse me. Yes? So if, in yes. So if you give you a ratio of trigonometric polynomials, can you find uh, like a tensor network description? If you what? If so, is it, so if it's a tensor network, then it is a ratio of trigonometric uh, right, and in fact, if if I in fact it goes the other way, if I if you give me things of this form, I can cook up something which is a tensor network at least in my my more general sense. Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't look like PEPs, but yes, yes, yes. Well, I haven't got a Hamiltonian yet. I'm just making states. Right. When we when we look at this kind of state here. Um, this does not depend on the details of all the details of the Hamiltonian. This only depends on uh, what is the occupied, the filled subspace for each k. And that allows you some leeway in what the Hamiltonian is. So there isn't any unique Hamiltonian associated with this 
given ground state in general. Well, that's what we're going to try to investigate if we don't run out of time. This correspondence is some kind of Fourier decomposition? Yes, it's just a Fourier decomposition and it comes directly from the local nature built into the tensor network. It's, I'm assuming in this talk, translation invariance, I use Fourier transforms and, um, and I integrate out these. I have to invert a matrix here, obviously and I get something which in general has this form. Okay? All right. Uh, okay. So what do we do with this now? So remember G, so GK as a matrix, well, I wrote it one way here, but now that I realize that these things are, ra these elements are now uh, ratios of trigonometric polynomials, let me introduce some different matrices without the hats u inverse v, okay? And u inverse, uh, u and v are matrices of, with trigonometric polynomial entries, okay? Um, now I could also have done it the other way around. I could have also written it as v, uh, v tilde, u tilde inverse, and put the inverse one on the right. And, um, and this is how I get uh, uh, these different matrices. Okay. And so the consequence of this now is now I can go back to my destruction operators that annihilate the ground state. Um, okay, now these I should have put a hat on because I used hats on the coefficients. So I want to define different ones. And so, uh, so again, I have these things. For example, D minus K alpha without the hat is some UK alpha alpha prime, CK alpha prime dagger, plus some on alpha bar, uh, VK alpha alpha bar, CK alpha bar. Dagger, so these don't involve the hats, and these are elements of U and V. Okay, and this, so this annihilates the ground state, and so does the other one, which uh, has the alpha bar index. The other one is constructed with from U tilde and V tilde. Now, what's the what's the point about this? So these are trigonometric polynomials. Uh, whole matrices of them. And so the Fourier transforms of these, dx alpha and also dx alpha bar, these annihilate the ground state. These are just defined by taking the inverse transform of these operators d. These annihilate the ground state, but these are Fourier transforms where I'm Fourier transforming functions which are trigonometric polynomials. And so these have compact support. Okay. Um, when I Fourier transform, I can always multiply in by e to the i, e to the i kx to any power, and the same for ky and kz and so on. And of course, you know, in, when you do that under a Fourier transform, that just, that just translates the thing that I get in real space. So I get a set of these, I get a set of these for all positions. And also for all alpha and alpha bar. Okay? So I have lots of these local operators that annihilate the ground state. This would not be something that I had in, uh, in a typical band structure. But it happens here because in tensor network states you should expect this to happen. And the reason is that in a tensor network state, um, you can think of it in terms of the fact I don't have to explain this to some people. So if I divide the system into, into a bounded region A and, and the remainder, um, so the, so the uh, connections are just uh, short range connections that go across the boundary. Let's say they're just on the edges as in PEPs. And then um, in the Schmidt decomposition, the Schmidt rank, the number of uh, vectors that occur with non-zero um, 
um, amplitudes in the Schmidt decomposition is bounded by the dimension of the auxiliary spaces crossing this cut. And if I make this region large enough, that goes like the something times the area, and the volume is much larger than that. So there are many vectors I can find in the Hilbert space associated with the interior that are not part of the Schmidt decomposition. And so a projection onto those vectors will annihilate the ground state. And more generally, there are also other operators that annihilate the ground state. And, um, and so consequently, you expect these uh, short-range operators, because they have to fit inside this region, you expect these uh, operators that exist, that annihilate this uh, tensor network state to exist, and this is exactly what we have here. No. No, the Vanier states are something different. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so Vanier states are a little bit more. It's not, just, it's not just any old localized packet, and it's not just any old functions here. In fact, if I took the uh, things that I had originally, these, uh, these guys here, then I would get some operators dx hat alpha and dx uh, alpha bar hat, and these are Vanier functions. So Vanier functions, um, what you're trying to do with Vanier functions is, um, is you want to find a, a, a basis, a basis with like single orbitals, but constructed only from a single band. And to do that, you have to take these orthonormal coefficients here and as functions of all k, and you take the transform. Those are Vanier functions. Okay. Um, but then we can point out that, in fact, when you, whenever the band structure is non-trivial, the bundle, the occupied bundle that we're using here, we have a section, really, of this bundle. This is basically using a, well, this Vanier state construction is using a section. For each of these is using a section of the bundle. And um, when the bundle is a non-trivial bundle in the sense that I defined, these have um, long-range tails, power law tails. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because it's non-trivial. The definition of non-trivial is that there are no global continuous sections, but that's what we were trying to use here. So these are not, not only non-analytic, they're not even continuous. Now they are normalized, and what, so what happens in the simple case, for example, is that, is that as, at some point in the balloon zone, the phase, there's always some phase choice you can make, but there's no way that you can make the phase choice uh, um, a consistent phase choice over the whole zone, which is continuous everywhere. There's going to be some point where it's uh, singular. It depends on the direction of approach. Excuse me, what does that physically correspond to? These, these ones? Yes. Well, they're Vanier functions. No, but if you, don't, if you have these, these continuities. Um, well, it corresponds to something that you chose to construct. But you don't have to do this. You know, No one forces you to make these Vanier functions. So I would take the point of view that it's a little unnatural because it involves a gauge choice, you see. There's a gauge choice involves certainly a U1 phase. And in fact, more generally, I could put in additional matrices here. You're choosing some, uh, some orthonormal set of sections, um, but they're gauge dependent in terms of transformations in each K within the, within the bundle. So, um, so why would you think that one choice of those was better than another choice? So Vanier functions are, in my view, not terribly natural objects to work with for this reason. Okay. But anyway, um, we have these other objects which, for the tensor network state, um, have compact support. Okay. All right. So now I have to try to actually uh, get towards a conclusion. Um, ah, good question. Well, so now we, now we come to the... Now we come to the crux of things. Um, all right, so what I should do is I should show you the simpler example. Um, do they form a complete basis? Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's go to the example. Maybe I have another question. Yep. Uh, you see, this ratio for trigonomical polynomial. Yep. Is this ratio always uh, finite, whether there's a pole or something like that? Um, it may not be finite when it's a ratio. Yeah. The denominator could vanish, and that will be important. So, so, so some conclusion here, whether you assume some finiteness, because uh, if well, there's a pole, then... I haven't assumed anything that I haven't mentioned. Okay. 
But I did point out that when G goes, G may go to infinity, and that corresponds to some point in the Grassmannian manifold, and certainly not going to be excluded. If I want it to be a non-trivial bundle, there have to be such points. That in itself is not bad. And that happens with the, with the typical states and ordin perfectly ordinary uh, examples. So that in itself is not a problem. Let me, let me look, do this example. So, so let's just take the case where n is 2, um, and also the dimension is 2. So n is 2, and obviously I can't choose anything except m is 1. So now gk is just a ratio of functions, which are complex numbers. These are trigonometric polynomials. And so this corresponds to a point in uh, the block sphere, if you like. And um, an example that we constructed, for some reasons that I won't have time to talk about, uh, something like this. Okay, so here it is, and in particular, this blows up at k is zero. Uh, so here, kappa and lambda are some parameters. So you should imagine that kappa is real, and kappa squared is real positive, lambda squared is real positive. There's a couple of parameters which don't play much role in what I want to say. And this blows up like one over kx plus iky as k goes to zero. Okay. And um, the fact that it does this means that this gives, basically it means that this gives a bundle, a filled, or, or for that matter, the unfilled band is a bundle with churn number one. So maybe plus one for the filled and minus one for the empty band, depending on a sign convention. They have to add up to zero, so it has to be like this. Okay. And the reason that it does that is that, is that if you think of this as covering the block sphere, um, it passes through infinity, which is the North Pole or the South Pole or something. But depending on the direction of approach, you see you come out with a different number. So it covers this, it wraps around this, and this is, you can actually define the churn number from these properties. It's called the degree of the map. So some people think that to define a, to calculate the churn number, you have to do that calculation of an integral of the Berry curvature. Um, you don't need to do that. If you have a not too complicated function, you can read it off by the properties at some point, such as the point where g goes to infinity. Okay. Um, so this is a non-trivial bundle, and um, so it's an example of what I want to talk about. And now we come to the, the issue of the parent Hamiltonian. Okay. So because of this property that I was talking about over there, there are many operators with compact support, and which may, we may, now we may consider ones that uh, conserve particle number. There are many operators that conserve particle number. In fact, I want to use single particle operators, uh, C dagger C type of operators, that annihilate, which have compact support and annihilate the ground state. And so this is what I can use for a parent Hamiltonian. Um, so this is going to be a Hamiltonian, which is, um, which should annihilate the ground state, and it should be positive semi-definite. And so I can construct a parent Hamiltonian, and one way I can do this, in still using my simple example, is I can use, um, uh, I've forgotten what, I, what my notation is. How am I going to indicate the other band if I don't have those? I have one here, that's right. And So the one and the two refer to the filled and the empty bands. And I can write down something like this. Now, if I had used the hat operators, I would get a flat band Hamiltonian, okay, with a, which certainly has a gap. But if I use these, what do I have? Well, in fact, the uh, energy spectrum of these, well, I can write it in terms of the flat band things. Um, uh, I need to, to normalize, you see, I need mod uk squared plus mod vk squared. And then I get the same things with hats on. K1, K1, K2. K2, 
And um, at each k, I know that this part gives me, um, gives me energy of either, either 1 or uh, minus 1. Um, at this point, uh, yeah, so this is positive semi-definite. So the state that I'm taking, it's calling the ground state, is the ground state. So that means these are both 1, actually, the way I've set it up now. Um, OK, and so the issue is, what's the behavior of mod u squared and mod v squared? Well, uk and vk have a common 0. Okay, they have a common zero. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's also a k is k is zero. You see, the numerator vanishes there, and the denominator vanishes there, and that's the only place, in fact, where where they both vanish at the same time. So that means that the that the uh, <clears throat> so the energy um, so this is gapless. So if I do it in the other in the other picture in the single particle picture. With epsilons, the bands are somehow touching here at zero as a function of k. And to answer the question about whether these states are complete, this also means that these are not uh, complete because they're constructed out of uk and vk here, and so k is zero is never included in the sum because the uk and vk vanish. And so the k is zero states are not included. So these, these, uh, these um, states are not quite complete. Okay. All right. So now, um, okay, so maybe it was just an accident. Maybe I just wrote down a bad example. Um, but in fact, for simple cases, at least I can prove directly that this parent Hamiltonian must be gapless. And um, so, well, this is partly theorem, partly conjecture. Okay. So, the, so for any such, now you don't have to write down this parent Hamiltonian. You could try throwing in other coefficients, for example. If you want things, if you want the parent Hamiltonian to have compact support, again, you have to use uh, trigonometric polynomials in the coefficients. In fact, you could write this in terms of the original C daggers and Cs. And, uh, and anyway, you need to use trigonometric polynomial coefficients to guarantee, um, the, to guarantee that it's uh, strictly short range. Uh, so any such parent Hamiltonian, and this is now for all D, N, and M, um, for, uh, for cases where the filled and empty bands are non-trivial, any such parent Hamiltonian is gapless. And this means that the energies for the filled and for the empty states should, um, should actually touch, or at least they come to the same energy. So that... Uh, um, Otherwise, if I, if I just said that one of these came to zero, which could happen, um, then I could, uh, but there was a gap, then I could add, I could always add a term where I just sum over all uh, A. I could always add the sort of chemical potential term, which is just the total particle number, and shift the zero of energy. And so I really need the bands to touch like this to say that it's really gapless. So, what? Well, so, um, so I, th I really thought I could prove this. Well, in fact, several times I thought I had a proof of this. Um, not the same proof each time. But it seems to be difficult, at least from the way I'm approaching things. So, um, so really I can prove this for all dimensions d and n is 2 or 3. And m, of course, is less than n. So that means m is basically 1. So in those cases, I can... I can prove it. Maybe I can, if I, you know. Um, I seem to be having difficulty doing such things for, for, for more general cases. There are mathematical subtleties that I won't get into now unless someone asks. But I can, but I can uh, sketch for, let's say, for example, for n is 2, um, um, I can sketch this, I guess. Uh, which way shall I do this? Let me do the more general 
Um, okay. So let me do, actually, let's do um, all n and m is 1. Okay, so let's, so the filled band is, is one dimensional. There's only one band below the Fermi energy. Okay, so that's a one dimensional bundle, a rank one bundle. And if it's non trivial, then this implies that um, any, so this, I only need to talk about one section. So any, therefore, any section has a zero. But the section means a choice of uh, u and, um, and v, u and v. Usually write this as a row vector. So u is 1 by 1, and v is, um, which are functions of k, is 1 by uh, n minus 1. Okay. So this is the section, and because it's non-trivial, this must have a zero, a common zero of all of the components of u and v. And so, um, and so consequently, that means that at least the filled band part of the Hamiltonian must touch zero, although it doesn't rule out the possibility of adding this. So I also need to show that the, the other part above the, uh, for, the, for the empty bands also touches zero. And this I can, this I can do well. If uh, for n is 2, the other one is, again, a, a rank 1 bundle, so it's the same argument. And it turns out for n is 3, I can also do this by, by elementary methods. What this means, uh, for the many-body sense, this wave function have a long-range equal-time correlation? Um, right. So, um, okay, so, uh, so just shortly after we posted our paper, uh, Norbert Schuch and, and co, um, and, and our chair, um, wrote a very closely related paper, and um, one of the things they mentioned is long-range correlations, which we had unfortunately missed in our first version. And, um, and this is also part of this, um, which hasn't, hasn't shown up in my discussion. Um, and so this provides another way into this, which is that the, um, the, bundles, the bundles themselves are non-analytic. So a projection operator to the filled bands, so I can write something down can write down a projection operator onto the filled bands, p hat, uh, turns out to be w hat dagger w hat for each, for, as a function of for each k. And, um, and this is again normalized. So you have to, uh, so you have to, um, so this is w dagger, and then I think I have w w dagger minus one w. And so here we have, again, ratios of trigonometric polynomials. And this is actually non-analytic at some point, although you have to go to some high, fairly high order in the Taylor expansion to see this. But, but okay. No, the two-point, because of, because of this fact, uh, the two-point correlator is basically this has the matrix elements are the same as matrix elements of this projection operator in real space. That's right. No, no. It has a non-analyticity in K space, and it's got a power law. Now, this is not the same as saying the Vanier functions are long range, because they are always long range, even when it's not a when it's not a um, tensor network state. Okay. Even, when the Vanier, even though for a non-trivial uh, bundle, the Vanier functions are long range, it's in, in, in general, it's possible for the projection operator to be only short range. Okay? So you know, more technically, this is itself a section of some bundle. It's a different bundle. It's a tensor product. And, um, and it always has uh, sections. So what's, what's really happening here is, is that the projection operator to the bands is becoming non-analytic at some points in k-space. And when that happens, the trigonometric polynomial sections that I was talking about, well, they're analytic, of course, in k-space. And so if this, is non if this is not analytic somewhere, what it means is that the, any sections of the bundle must become linearly independent at that point in order to avoid the, the non-analyticity, just by an uh, argument by contradiction. Okay. Um, 
Now again, uh, in order to prove this, well, you know, certainly here, so here you can look at this and you can, um, did I say what W is? I guess I did. So W is, remind you that W is uh, U, V in general. So these are matrices side by side. So this is, this is uh, M by N minus M in size um, in the general case. Um, so again, this is some matrix whose entries are ratios of trigonometric polynomials, and um, for a non-trivial bundle, there's going to be points where the rows of this matrix W are not linearly independent. So that causes a potential problem with the inverse here, you see, and, um, and then you have to figure out what happens at that point. And uh, one ought to be able to prove that this is always non-analytic, in fact, but that seems to require some sort of detailed stru uh, study of the geometry of these things near, the, near this point, which I don't have a really convincing general argument for. Maybe, maybe Norbert will say something more about that. So this is one argument for why, for why this happens. And I think this is, this is probably the deepest way to look at it. There's, the bundles themselves are not analytic. So that's just how it is. You assume this A is a strictly short range. A? This A, you have a, this A, A tensor, which is uh, in the Glassman variable. You, I think you erase it. Yes, I did. I did, did assume it's strictly short range. Yeah, and uh, it does relate to this. Uh, if you assume yeah, A only decays yeah. naturally, well, maybe. The, well, then it's not a tensor network state. Yeah, but, but then there's a W main. So, okay, so I mean, there's various, there's various statements that you can make. So, so if my single particle Hamiltonian has. Um, exponentially decaying matrix elements, then my uh, bundle, uh, and I have a gap around the Fermi energy, then all the correlations decay exponentially, and I have analytic uh, bundles. Okay. Um, otherwise, we can't guarantee anything. All right, so I think this is the right place to stop, and I will thank you for your attention. Suppose you, if it is A, you have a pretty long range, like a tan lattice spacing. Yes. Can I say, well, this singularity became very, very weak. I mean, some very, very high power. Could be. Algebra, could be. But then if you go to long distances, eventually, although it might be falling off pretty fast, at short distances, at long distances, you'll see a power law. I see. Right? So some kind of, then that's because some kind of little technical, you mean. There's a short range, strictly short range requirement, tensor network yes. somehow. That's the point. The tensor networks are strictly short range. Yeah. And this turns out to be pushing things a little bit too far, or almost too far. I mean, if I still have time, I, I can comment that you may think, well, it's gapless. That means it's at a critical point. I would say, no, it's not at a critical point. This is a slightly different phenomenon. For example, if you have a Dirac point in the spectrum, which really is a critical point, so what happens there is that the, the, uh, the bundle, the, well, the, fill, the states in the filled band don't even form a bundle because the vectors uh, behave discontinuously as you approach the Dirac point from different directions. You don't even have a bundle. So that's what happens when you have a phase transition. Here you do have a bundle and it has a perfectly well-defined churn number. So in that sense, it, it's, it's a topological phase. That's, that's why I say it's a topological phase at the beginning. But, but it's gap. No. Well, I don't think so. Is minus one yeah. One well, they are touching, and you could you could probably perturb this in various ways and make things happen. But at this particular point, it's certainly not. At this point, it's not behaving the same way as um, as a, as a direct point. Okay. So you do have. You know, it might be on the borderline between different things. You could perturb it one way and, and just open a gap and have have a, have a have a good topological phase. So how does the density of states go as you um, If I remember right, I think this vanishes quadratically, so then you can figure it out. So quadratically in two dimensions means a, means a constant density of states, single particle density of states. <coughs> so, so that next slide, so I feel about the uh, statement about long-range correlation. So, so uh, it's different from a, a critical theory where you really have long-range correlation, critical correlation context here. Uh, the 
it's, um, it's not really, in that sense it's not different, it just, um, just it's probably it decaying it. faster, it would be decaying faster than So you, you look at something like this, and it's decaying as a power. But it's a fairly fast power.